Welcome to this episode. It's called Rumpel and the Younger Generation. It's the first of the series of Thames Television did. It introduces uh, Rumpel, the lovable, grumpy, uh, sometimes obstreperous old Bailey hack. It also introduces his wife, Hilda, who I really invented in order to give him as much of a tough time at home as he was getting at court. And his son, Nick, who comes to watch his father in court. And it introduces... Uh, a well-known family of South London villains called the Timpsons, who do ordinary decent crime and uh, actually keep Rumpole in bread and butter and an occasional uh, glass of wine at Pomeroy's Wine Bar. So uh, this is Nick, and he comes to see his father perform in court, and his father Rumpole hopes he has a noble idea of lawyers, and Nick perhaps doesn't have such a noble idea as Rumpole has and as I have. So... Uh, Welcome to the first episode. That's where they bring the money out. I'm off the van. Here. The butcher shop's here. Opposite the church. There's only two old geezers with all that money. Come on in. Who's going to do the tyres? We can hide anywhere in here. about us in our imprisonment. Shades of the prison house begin to close around the growing boy. Oh, I'm not talking about your son, I hope. Ah. You're never referring to Nick. Oh, shades of the prison house begin to close. No, not round our boy. <coughs> not round young Nick. Shades of the public schoolhouse are closed around him. The thousand quid a year remand home. He's breaking up this morning. Ah, shades of the prison house begin to open up for the holes. Nick has to be met at Victoria at 11.15 and given lunch. When he went back to school, you promised him a show. Yes. You haven't forgotten. Of course I haven't forgotten. The only show I can offer him, I'm afraid, is a robbery with violence. Number two court at the Old Bailey. Oh, I wish it was a murder. Nick so enjoyed my murders. I must fly. Daddy gets so crotchety if anybody's late, and he does love his visits. Our father who art in Horsham, give me old sweetheart my regard. Oh, sweetheart is hardly the way you used to refer to your head of chambers. Yes, well, I find it difficult to remember to call my head of chambers daddy. Well, Nick, I'll be back in good time to give him his supper. Your wish is my command. And try not to make the kitchen look as if it had been hit by a bomb. 
I hear you, master of the blue horizon. She who must be obeyed. Sir? Yes. Hello, son. Got special permission to come and see you, you being a lad of tender years and all. Well, you've got to know the ropes around here. I'm all right, is she? Mum, yeah, of course she's all right. Come over here. She's got your best jacket out. The cleaners take that off. Now, remember, stand up straight and keep your hands out your pockets. The red judge at the old bailey is called my lord. Don't go call him sir or your honour. I'll show your ignorance. Sir, Peanut's boy. He's giving evidence for the prosecution. Well, don't you worry about young Peanut's. Your briefer take care of him. We got you the best brief in the business. And Mr. Rampart. Well, just remember, son, stand up straight and do what Mr. Rampart tells you. And good luck. You're all out there. The old family's behind you. Don't forget to put that tie on, will you? Yes, right you are, then. Oh, we've got the papers in your indecent assault, Mr. Erskine Brown, down in London. Oh, really, Alice? I, was... I told you I wanted something on the civil side. I'm sick to death of crime. A person who's sick of crime is sick of life, Erskine Brown. And, Mr. Frobisher, you'll be doing your nuisance at Bloomsbury County Court. Ah, civil work, George. You lucky beggar. That's what I need. It's Martin, not before two o'clock. Yes, I can see that, old dear. One has to hang about, sir, to do a nuisance nowadays. <laughs> I shall go down to the library, Albert, to look at some more. Morning, Rumpel. Hello, George. Coming down to the library with me, Albert? I'd rather spend the day in the morgue, young man. Anything for me, Albert? Ah, no, Mr. McClay, another day off for you, I'm afraid. Ah, you're dangerous and careless at Clark was on the mantelpiece, Mr. Hoskins. No checks, I suppose, Albert. Not today, Mr. Hoskins, now. Henry? Yes, Mr. Tree? You want me to go down Clark Mark Court, Mr. Hoskins? We don't want you near any court, Henry. Not till we've learnt to clean our fingernails and shine our shoes every morning. But you could make me a cup of instant, because I'm parched. No, no checks for me either, Percy. You know the old saying, crime doesn't pay. Well, not for a very long time. Listen, Tony, if you're to do so, why don't you join me down at the Bailey later on? You can uh, take a note or something. Are you sure you wouldn't mind? I'd be grateful. Where are we, Albert? Oh, the robbery is not before 11.30, sir. Court number two, before Everglade. Ah. Mr. Gusby Featherston's against you. Oh, give me Featherston. Apparently. Oh, I had an all night sitting down at the house last night. Oh, I don't suppose your robbery will be much of a worry. Oh, no, except perhaps the young Jim Simpson. Oh, Albert, uh, Mrs. Rumpole's gone down to see her father in, in um, Horsham. Oh, my aunt had a horse shop in Tisham. <laughs> how is Winston? Any better, is he? Oh, no, it's just about the same, Uncle Tom. Thanks. And how's young Nick? Oh, splendid. Ah, Nick! Albert, he's breaking up today. He'll need a meeting in Victoria at 11.15. And then if you bring him along, he can watch some of the robbery in number two. Hmm? Your son's going to be in the audience, is he? Yeah. Better be brilliant. Oh, I wouldn't bother, old man. She's old daddy's come to see, after all. <laughs> touché, Rampel. Distinct more touché. Yes. Well, you. I better get down to the belly. I'll walk with you. Well, oh, won't you need a stretcher or something after an all-night sitting with the gas mains enabling bill or whatever? <laughs> Tony, see you later on. Oh, right. You've been at this game a long while, Rumpo. Oh, yes, quite a while. You never thought of taking self? What? Rumpo QC? Not on your nilly. Rumpo queer customer, that's what they'd be bound to call me. Well, could you know, with your seniority? Morning, sir. Oh, I dare say. If I, uh, played golf with the right judges, put up for Parliament, they might make me an artificial suit. Or, uh, at any rate, a nylon. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. You did put up for Parliament. Yes. You've never thought of it? No, never. I have the honour to be an old Bailey hack. That's quite enough for me. Lord in Newgate Street, the city fathers, a stately law court did decree. And there it is. The dome and the blindfold lady. 
Yes, well, it's much better. She doesn't see all that's going on. Complete with murals, marble statues, and underground accommodation for some of the choicest villains in London. Terrible things go on here. Horrifying things. Why is it I never go through these portals without a thrill of pleasure, a slight tremble of excitement? Now, why does it always seem a much jollier place than my flat in Gloucester Road, under the strict rule of she who must be obeyed? Morning, Harry. Morning, gentlemen. Morning, Harry. I'll have to give up. I'll have to give up, you know. Propped up, I'm afraid. Oh, nonsense, Daddy. You'll go on for years. No, Hilda, no. They'll have to start looking for another head of chambers. Rumpel's the senior man. That is, of course, apart from Uncle Tom, and he doesn't really practice nowadays. Your husband the senior man. How time flies. I recall when he was the junior man, my pupil. You said he was the best youngster on bloodstains you'd ever known. Rumpo, oh yes. Her husband was pretty good on bloodstains. Shaky, though, on the law of landlord and tenant. What sort of practice is Rumpo now? Oh, he has a tremendously busy practice. Rumpo hardly ever stops. He's in court today. Which court? I believe today it's um, the Old Bailey. It's always the Old Bailey, isn't it? Most of the time, I suppose so. Not a frightfully good address, the old Bailey, not exactly the SW1 of the legal profession. Oh, Rumpole only went down to the Bailey today because he knows the family. Mm. It seems they've got a young boy in trouble. Son gone wrong. Mm. Oh, very sad, that. Especially if he comes of a really good family. Ah, the Timpsons, all family in all their glory. It's like an old school reunion. I've never seen so many ex-clients at one go. Mr. Rumpel. Oh, well, Mr. Bernard. You're instructing me. Always in a Timpson case, Mr. Rumpel. Oh, nothing but the best for the Timpsons. Best solicitor, best barrister going. Yeah. Shall I do the honours? Yes, do. There's Vi, my wife. I got Vi off on a handling charge after the Croydon bank raid. Well, there was really no evidence. Uncle Cyril? Long time what was this here. last outing exactly? Carrying housebreaking instruments by night. Uncle Dennis? Uh, oh, you remember Den, surely, Mr. Oh, yes. Yeah. Conspiracy to forge logbooks. And uh, Den's Doris? It would have been receiving a vast quantity of stolen scampi. Yes, acquitted by a majority. Uh, yours truly, Frederick Timpson, the boy's father. Oh, we had a slip up with Fred's last spot of bother. I was away with flu. Well, uh, shall we all sit down? George Robisher took it over. He got three years. No, he must have only just got out. So, uh, now you know the whole family, Mr. Rampol. Our family to breed from, the Timpsons. Without them, the old bear leaves you out of business. From time to time, uh, I'm quite sure you're going to do your very best for our young Jimbo. He's a good boy. He was ever so good to me while Dad was away. Head of the family at 14, with Dad off on one of his regular visits to Her Majesty. It's uh, young Jim's first appearance, like, at the Bailey. Yeah. His bar mitzvah, his first communion. All those other boys got clean away with it. Yes, well, that's a bit of luck. They can't be asked if Jimbo was one of the party. The identification by the butcher is pretty hopeless. Yes, well, would you have a photographic impression of a young hopeful that struck you on the skull with a cricket stump? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, all they've really got is uh, this alleged confession that Jim made to Peanuts Malloy. Peanuts Malloy, little grass. Yeah, old Chalky White fed him up with that one, didn't he? Yeah. Chalky? Uh, Chief Detective Inspector White, Hell Division. Well, why would Inspector White want to fit up your Jimbo Jacob? Well, because he's a Timson, Mr. Rumpel. Yeah, because he's the apple of our eye like. Being as how he's the baby of the family. <laughs> but Chalky would fit up his own mother if he'd get him a smile off his superintendent, you know. Morning, Fred. Morning, Chief Inspector. Morning, Mrs. Timson. Morning, Chief Inspector. Um, Mr. Timson, I think we'll shift our ground. Remove, good friends. Ah, then, Mr. Timson. How exactly do you say Chief Inspector Chalky White fitted up your Jimbo? Which is the coffee? Ah, uh, thank you, love. All right, that's it. Well, we put that little grass peanuts into Jim's painting class in the Romando, didn't he? 
I see. So your Jimbo was supposed to have poured out his heart to two peanuts. Yeah, let me... Uh, thank you. We plan to do the old blokes from the butchers and snatch the tape. Uh, as if I'll bring up Jim to talk like that in the nick. <laughs> the Timpsons ain't stupid. No, his dad's always told him. Never say a word to anyone you're banged up with. Bound to be a graph. That's right. Fred's always brought the boy out proper, any day. Oh, just like he should be. Yeah, and especially the Malloys. <laughs> They're noted grasses, that family. Always have been. The Malloys is beyond the pale. Right. Well known for it. Look, how did, this, how did this family feud begin, exactly? Good Peanuts' granddad. He shot my old father over the Streatham Co-op robbery. Oh, pre-war, that was, wasn't it? Yeah, Streatham yeah. Co-op kid, yeah. I believe I was in that. Ah, oh, yes, there wasn't much honour shown among thieves, if I remember. Then you can understand, Mr Rumpole. No Timpson has even spoke to a Malloy ever since. Now, you're quite sure that your Jimbo wouldn't say a word to Peanuts? I'll give you my word of honour on it, Mr Rumpole. Ain't that good enough for you? No Timpson would ever speak to a Malloy, not under any circumstances. No. No, never. No. Me? Speak to Peanuts? Yeah. No Timpson don't ever speak to no Malloy. It's a point of honour, like. Ever since the Stratton Cobb case, eh? Your grandfather. I told you about that, did he? Yes, don't tell me. Well, he wouldn't let me speak to no Malloy. Well, he wouldn't put up with like. Well, Jimbo, what's the defence? Well, I've never done it. That's an interesting defence. Somewhat unusual, isn't it, as far as the Timpsons are concerned? I've got my alibi, am I? Ah, yes, your alibi. Dad reckoned it was pretty good, my alibi. Yes, let's hear it again. Straight, Straight after, after school, school on that... that... Straight after school on that uh, Friday, June the 2nd, I went up to tea at my Auntie Doris's and arrived there at exactly half past five. At six o'clock, my Uncle Den came home from work, accompanied by my Uncle Cyril. At seven o'clock, when this alleged crime was taking place, I was sat round the television with my auntie and two uncles. I well remember we was watching the newcomers. The family gave in that alibi. Clubbed together for it like a new bicycle. The jury will see at once the lad comes from a family of villains who keep a cupboard full of alibis for all occasions. Yes, of course, you're right. Of course, the infuriating thing about the alibi is it might even be true. <laughs> Mr. Featherstone? May it please you, my lord. Members of the jury, I appear in this case to prosecute. The defendant is represented by my learned friend, Mr. Horace Rumpole. Uh, Mr. Who did you say, Mr. Featherstone? Uh, Mr. Rumpole, my lord. Um, R-U-M-P. That's right. Spell it out for him, old darling. Mr. Justice Everglade, known to his few friends as Flory, is a stranger to the old bailey. His father was Lord Chancellor, around about the time Jim's grandfather was doing over the Streatham Co-op. Educated Winchester and Belial. Cracks the Times crossword in the opening of an egg. Most happy with international trust companies suing each other over nice points of law. Here for a fortnight slumming down the old belly. <laughs> wonder what he's going to make of young peanuts and boys. Carrying their takings to a grey Austin van parked in Fawcett Yard. Just around the corner. Members of the jury, I think it only fair that you should know that it is alleged that Timpson took part in this attack with a number of other youths, uh, none of whom have been arrested. The boy stood on the burning deck when saw that he fled. It is quite right that you should tell the jury that, Mr. Featherstone. Perfectly right and proper. If your lordship pleases. No, what's this? The old Chums League? Fellow members of the Atherton? I'm most grateful to your lordship for... Oh, well, why don't you crawl up on the bench and black his boots for him, old darling? So I imagine the young man's defence is that he wasn't a justem generis with the other lads. Well, I'm sorry, my lord, you were asking about the defence. Mr. Rumpole. 
I am reluctant to intrude on your confidential conversation with my learned friend, my lord. But uh, as Jim Timson's counsel, I thought that perhaps I might know a little more about his case than the uh, counsel for the prosecution. I imagine your client says he was not a Eustem Generis with the other lad. A Eustem Generis, my lord. Oh, yes, he's always saying that. A Eustem Generis is a phrase in constant use in his particular part of Brixton. Yes. Hold <laughs> well on, Dad. Oh, thanks, Nick. Yes, Lovely to see you. Sorry I couldn't turn on a murder for you. That's all right. Out as an identity to raid. Nevertheless, there is strong evidence against him. <coughs> Members of the jury, this case isn't based on any alleged confession to the police, or indeed to anyone in authority. I shall be calling a young man, Malloy, of the same age group as the defendant, to whom you will hear he admitted his guilt in the clearest possible terms. Not the easiest sort of case, Nick, as you see. Well, this young man... Is that your client, then? Yes, that's him, as usual. Oh, my client's in very good in talk. <laughs> Looks as if he ought to be in the fifth form. I fell into conversation with uh, Timson during a painting class. Oh, dear. Oh, sorry, Everclay, doesn't know his business. How do you not give me enough time to get across the road for a decent lunch? Well, this is fine, honestly. And one thing you can say against crime. The restaurant facilities aren't up to much. <laughs> Didn't you want to have lunch upstairs in the bar mess? Oh, with you here? Never. I'd rather die than have lunch in the bar mess. It's like the prefect's room in a junior public school. Oh, not your prefect room, of course. <laughs> Talking about school. Hmm. Um... A trouble? A little trouble, yes. Let me tell you at once. There's no need to say a word that might be taken down and used in evidence. <laughs> you know the old vicarage opposite the schoolhouse? Mm. I mean, it's been empty for years. It's practically falling to pieces. You helped it fall? We used to get in there some Sunday evenings. We used it for parties. Get in there? How exactly? The kitchen window. Didn't leave much opening. That's a technical break-in under the Forcible Entries Act. What, uh... What time did you effect this entry? Pretty late, after chapel. It's burglary at common law and, of course, civil trespass. What, uh, what sort of parties, exactly? We had a poker school. You haven't run into bankruptcy, have you? I owe Crabtree two pounds ten. I mean, I mean, we let a lot of people play. Contrary to the betting, gaming and lotteries act, 1963. We used to get a bottle or two of cherry brandy in there. Serving liquor on unlicensed premises. Well, Crabtree actually asked a couple of girls from the village, but, but Bagnall never got to hear about that. <sighs> then there's no evidence of girls. As far as your case is concerned, there is no reason to suppose the girls ever existed. As for the other charges, they are serious. Yes, yes, I, I suppose they are, rather. Well, I suppose you were walking past the place in the evening. You uh, heard the noise, and uh, you went in to investigate. Dad, Bagnall came in and found us playing poker. I know. My lord, my client was only playing poker so as not to appear too pious while he lectured his fellow sixth formers against the evils of gambling and cherry brandy. Don't be serious. Serious? Why don't you want me to defend you? No. Bagnall's not going to call in the police or anything like that. Well, what's he going to do? Well, I'll just miss next term's exeunt. Do some extra work. I just thought I should tell you before you get a letter. <laughs> yes, thanks, me. Thank you, I'm glad you told me. So there's no question of the police? Police, of course not. The old Bagnall doesn't want any trouble. I mean, after all, still at school. Still at school? Of course you are. You and young Timson. Yes. I'm sorry, it's stupid of me. Yeah, the fish and chips don't look too bad. <laughs> May I call you peanuts? If you like. You uh, go to the same school as Jim? Yeah. But you're not really friends? Nah, not really. No, the, uh, you don't speak to each other. The Timpsons and the Malloys are rather like the Montagues and the Capulets. Hmm? What did you say they were, Mr. Rumpel? Not a usedom generous, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peanuts, how would you describe yourself? Is that a proper question? I mean artistically. Are you a latter-day impressionist? Do all your oil paintings in little dots, do you? Or perhaps an abstract, white squares on a white background? Or do you indulge in watches melting in the desert like our dear old friend Salvador Dali? I don't know what you're talking about. Neither, I must confess, my lord, do I. 
Sit quietly, Feathers, and all will be revealed. To you. Are you a dedicated artist? The Rembrandt of the remand home. I hadn't done no art before. Well, that's what I rather thought. So are we to understand that this occasion when Jimbo poured out his heart to you was the first painting lesson you'd been to? Yeah. Well, how long have you been in the remand home? A couple of months. Put down for a bit of an air fry. Yeah, I didn't ask you that. And I'm quite sure your reasons for being on demand are entirely creditable. No, what I want to know is, why this sudden fascination with the arts? Well, the chief screw. You mean you were told to join the painting school and put yourself next to Jimbo, is that it? It was well, something well, like that, yeah. Uh, what did he say? Uh, something like that, my lord. And you were there, not in pursuit of art, peanuts, but in pursuit of evidence. Now, you knew that perfectly well, and you supplied your masters with just what they wanted to hear. No, Jimbo had never said a word to you. Uh, my lord, I don't know quite what my learned friend uh, is saying. Is he, in fact, suggesting that the Oh, it's an old trick. Put your suspect, bang him up with a notable grass. If you really push for evidence, they've been doing it with grown-ups often enough. Now they're trying it with children. Mr. Rampole, you're speaking a language which is totally foreign to me. Then let me try and make myself clear, my lord. I'm suggesting that the witness, Peanuts Malloy, was put into the painting class as a deliberate trap. You're suggesting Mr. Malloy was not a genuine amateur painter? No, indeed, my lord. Merely an amateur witness. Yeah. I see. <laughs> I see. Go on, Mr. Rampo. Tell me, what, what did you first say to Jim as you drew your easel alongside? I don't remember. Don't you? Oh, but you did say something. You were on speaking terms. Well, I think we were speaking about the stones. What stones were those? The rolling stones. I'm afraid a great deal of this case is taking place in a foreign town, Mr. Rumpel. Oh, uh, uh, jazz musicians, as I understand it, my lord, of some notoriety. The notoriety hasn't reached me. Yes, well, go on. Well, we was talking about their concert, the Hammersmith Odeon. Well, we both went there, like. And well, we talked about that. Oh, and then Jim said, well, he said how he and these other blokes had done up the butchers. Uh, Jim said um, he and the other blokes had done the butchers. Well. Will this be a convenient moment to adjourn, Mr. Rumpel? Yeah, it's convenient for peanuts. He'll have his second wind tomorrow. Mr. Rumpel? Oh, yes, my lord. Yes, perfectly convenient. If your lordship please. That was very good, Hilda. Yes, a bit of an improvement on the old Bailey canty, Nick, eh? Although well, that's not saying much, I'm afraid. Well, I don't see about clearing up. Yeah. Grandpa sent you his love, Nick. Will you remember to write? He's definitely retiring as head of chambers. Ah. He quite appreciates that you're the senior man. Dad. Yes, I'm sorry. Will you still be cross-examining peanuts tomorrow? Oh, I'll try to keep it going, but I've got a horrible feeling I've rather shot in a bolt as far as young Peanuts Malloy is concerned. You really think he's lying? Oh, if he's not, he's giving a damn good imitation of it. Nick enjoyed the show, didn't you, Nick? Even though it was only a robbery. I wish you could have been there when I was cross-examining on the bloodstains in the Penn's Bungalow murder. Oh, Nick wasn't born when you did the Penn's Bungalow murder. Oh, I know. Oh, bad luck, old son. <laughs> well, you were great with that judge. Ah, old Florrie. This extraordinary judge who kept talking Latin and Dad was teasing him. You want to be careful, you know, how you tease judges, if you're to be head of chambers. Head of chambers, Daddy, honestly. Oh, I suppose it's possible. <laughs> can I come with you tomorrow, down the old bailey? Of course you can. I've got your dental appointment tomorrow. Eleven o'clock, you've got to be in Harley Street to see Mr. Trage. She who must be obeyed. Now, never mind. Mm. You won't miss much, Nick. It's a pretty run-of-the-mill sort of case. Although... As I'm sure you've noticed. It does have one rather extraordinary feature. Go on, Watson. You interest me strangely. Ah, do you still read those tales? Well, well, not lately. Do you remember I used to read them to you after she had ordered you to bed? When you weren't too busy noting up your murders. On the walks on Hampstead Heath, and you were Holmes, and I was Watson. I remember one walk. Tell me, Holmes, what, in your opinion, was the most remarkable piece of evidence given by the witness? <laughs> Peanuts Malloy. When he said they were talking about the Rolling Stones. You astonish me, Holmes. Well, you see, Watson, we were led to believe that they were such enemies. Yeah? You know, the families weren't, um, Aylston generous. <laughs> go on, go on, here. Have a bit more of this. It stimulates the detective abilities. There they were, chatting about a pop concert. Mm -hmm. Well, didn't that strike you as strange, my dear Watson? If you ask me, it struck me as bloody rum. 
have both been to the concert. That doesn't mean anything, not necessarily. I mean, I was at that concert. Were well, you indeed? I got time off from school. I don't recall you mentioning it. I said I was going to the festival hall. Yeah. Oh, very wise. As far as your mother's concerned, I should think that at the Hammersmith Odeon, they probably reenact some of the worst excesses of the Roman Empire. <laughs> I don't suppose you saw young Peanuts or Jimbo there, did you? And there were about 2,000 fans, all screaming. Yes, of course. I don't, don't know if that helps. I mean, if they were old mates, Jimbo might have confided in him. Oh, Peanuts was lying. And you spotted it. You've got the instinct, Nick. You've got a nose for the evidence. Your career at the bar is bound to be brilliant. Tell me, old man, when do you take in silk? <laughs> Mr. Whiston was good enough to send me a letter this morning, sir. Oh? From Horsham General Hospital. Ah, yes, yeah, so old daddy's not quite up to snuff, I'm yeah, He mentions his retirement. Oh, really? I think we'll manage pretty well with you, Mr. Rumpole, as head of chambers. Oh, do you think so, Evan? There's not much you and me want me to sort out, sir, over a glass or two in Pomeroy's wine bar. <laughs> And soon we'll be welcoming Master Nick in the chambers. Nick! Yes, well, yes, he's certainly showing some legal aptitude, no doubt. It'll be a real family affair, Mr. Rumble, if you want my opinion. Like father, like son. <laughs> like father, like son. How very nice. Mr. Rumpel, I've checked that date. Yeah. You clever old darling. Thank you very much, Mr. Bernard. When Jim told you that he'd done up the butchers, uh, did he say the date that that had happened? Uh, my lord, the date is very clearly set out in the indictment. My lord, I am cross-examining on behalf of my young client who is charged with a very serious offence. I would be grateful if my learned friend did not volunteer information which is known to all of us here in court except the witness. Very well. Please go on, Mr. Rumpel. Did he tell you the date? No, he never told me when. I thought it was sometime in the summer. Sometime in the summer. Are you a... <coughs> Are you a fan of the Rolling Stones, Peanuts? Yeah. Remind me, they were... The musicians. Shut up, Featherstone. Oh, thank you, Mr. Featherstone. And, uh, and is Jim, too, a fan? He was, yeah. Uh, you discussed music uh, before you uh, met in the Remand home? Before the Nick? Oh, yeah. You talked about it at school together? Yeah. And uh, in quite a friendly way? Mm. Well, we was all right, yeah. Did you ever go to a concert with Jimbo? No, well, we went uh, to just one... Just a minute, now think carefully. Yeah, we went to one or two concerts together. In the evening? Yeah. And what would you do? Would you uh, call to his home, collect him? You're joking. What? You must be joking. No, in this case, I'm not joking at all. Well, of course I wouldn't call it his own. No, the families don't speak. You wouldn't be welcome at each other's houses. The Montagues and the Capulets, Mr. Rumpel. Uh, if your lordship pleases. Your lordship puts it extremely aptly. So what would you do if you were going to a concert together? Well, we'd leave store together, like, and then just hang around the cafes. Hang around the cafes? The cafes, Mr. Rumpel. Yes, of course, the cafes, my lord. Before you went up west. Uh, if your lordship would allow me to translate, before they went to the west end of London together. Yeah. So you wouldn't be separated when you went to a concert together? We hang around together. Did that happen when you went to the Rolling Stones concert at the Hammersmith Odeon? Yeah. That was the summer, wasn't it? In the summer, yeah. So you left school together? And hung around the cafes, then we went up to the Odeon. And you were together that evening the whole time? I told you, didn't I? Yes, indeed, you told me. Thank you very much. My lord, perhaps my learned friend might be interested in knowing the date of the one and only Rolling Stones concert at the Hammersmith Odeon this year. He might like to compare it with the date of the offence as so conveniently set out in the indictment. You had an alibi. You had a proper, reasonable, truthful alibi. And joy of joys, it even came from the prosecution. Now, why the hell didn't you tell me? Your dad wouldn't have liked it. Your dad wouldn't have liked it. And because of that, you were prepared to be found guilty. You were prepared to be convicted of robbery with violence. Dad got the family to alibi me. Keep it in the family. Oh, well, I've got to collect my things. Anyway, thanks a lot, Mr. Rumpole. That's it, I could rely on you to win the daylight. Cheers. No, wait, I didn't win the day. It was like that was a sheer fluke, Jimbo. It'll never happen again. I'm joking, Mr. Rumpole. 
My dad told me about you. He says he never let the Timpsons down. Do you think that's what I'm here for? To help you along in a career like your dad's? Oh, God, I shouldn't have asked those questions. I shouldn't have found out the date of that concert. Then you'd really be happy, wouldn't you? Then you'd really be able to follow in your dad's footsteps all your life. Sharp spells in Boston to learn the mysteries of housebreaking, and then on to a solid life of crime. Oh, you might do really well. You might end up in Parkhurst in the maximum security wing, doing a glamorous 20 years and a hero to the screws. Just let these things at the gate, Mr. Rampole. Come on, Timson. You can't stay here all night. Well, I've got to go. I've not had a face with Dad, really. Maybe being so friendly with peanuts. Oh, Jim, wait a minute. Just, just, just a minute. Oh, come here. Now, listen. If you're pleased with the way I did your case... Oh, I am, Mr. Rumpel. Frankly, I'm quite satisfied. Oh, I'm glad. Look, would you consider doing me a favour? Why? Are we on legal aid? Of course we're on legal aid. No, it's not that. Listen, haven't you ever thought about getting away from your home? I couldn't do that. Not ever. Why not? Well, you know, my mum depends on me. See, like when Dad goes away. Well, she depends on me then as head of the family. Head of the family. Cheers. Oh. That looks so miserable, Mr. Rumpole. You won, didn't you? Nobody won, Inspector. But truth emerges sometimes, even down the old baby. But he's a Timpson. Runs in the family. We'll get him, sooner or later. Yes, I suppose you will. Oh, yeah, thanks, Frank. Hello, George. Hello, Hello. Grandpa. Come and join us. Mm. Marvellous win, that. <coughs> I've just been telling them. Yes, I hear you've had a splendid win, oh, Rumpel. Railing clouds of glory do we come. <laughs> It'll be years before you get the cheque. Yeah, what was it about exactly? I forget. You don't get paid for years at the old Bailey. I tried to cut my gross of that. If you had to wait as long to be paid for a pound of sugar, I tell him, as we do for an armed robbery. Uh, Albert tells me he's had a letter from Whiston. Uh, well, I'd just like to say, Rumpel, I think we'd all like to say, you'll make a splendid head of chambers. Shades of the prison house begin to close around the growing boy, but he beholds the light and whence it flows and sees it in his joy. Uh, Rumpel quotes Wordsworth, does it quite often. But does the growing boy behold the light, George? Or was the old sheep of the Lake District being unduly optimistic? <laughs> well, I think it'll be very refreshing to have a head of chambers who quotes poetry. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the Times, Rumpel? No, haven't had time, the crossword. Guthrie Featherstone, he's taken silk. It's the stockings that are the problem. Uh, yes, they would be. Keeping them up. I do understand. Yes. Well, uh, Marigold. Who? My wife, Marigold. Why? My wife, Marigold. Oh, that Marigold! Yes. She's a nurse, you know. And, um... She put me in touch with a shop which supplies suspender belts to nurses, <laughs> amongst others. Really? Yes, yes. Yards of elastic for the large award sister. <laughs> well, it works miraculously. You're wearing a suspender belt, you sexy devil. <laughs> Good Lord, I'd never realised the full implications of rising to the height of the legal profession. Sometimes as we had champagne in chambers. Sometimes as we had a silk in chambers. I recall them. George, you like it. We had a fellow in chambers once. Called Balstrow, of course, before you were born. And someone gave him a hundred guineas for six months' pupilage. Do you know what this Balstrow fellow did? No. Stood champagne all round. The next day he ran off to Kelly with his junior clerk, and we never saw hide nor hair of him again. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ralph. Whose pupil were you? I don't remember. Oh, no, he was my pupil, I was told. Oh, well, George wouldn't do a thing <laughs> like that. <laughs> At least I don't think, would you? But I, I missed the beginning of that, I was told. Well, I was <laughs> telling you about this fellow, Balstrow, do you see? And someone gave him a hundred guineas. Ah! Ah, that was well met. I do! You do look distinguished. Well, we'll have to cut a certain figure down the house of Lord, you know, Mr. Rumpel. Ah. I hope I'll have the pleasure of going down with you one day, sir. Never, Albert, I promise you. <laughs> Not ever. Now yeah, then, Henry, uh, we don't want you getting Miss Marchbanks tiddly. <laughs> you may film me up, however. <laughs> really, Mr. Tree, sure you wouldn't rather have a glass of instant? No, no, no. no, no. Thank you, Henry, sir. There you go, sir. Lovely. Only ten years call, and he's an MP and leading counsel. He's a PI, you see. Guthrie's frightfully good at the PR. At the what? Well, Guthrie always says the most important thing at the bar is to be polite to your instructing solicitor. 
Oh, well, I'd be solicitous. You know, that never occurred to me. Guthrie admires you so, Mr. Rumpel. Oh. He admires your style of advocacy. Well, I suppose it makes a bit of a change from bowing three times and offering to black the judge's boots for him. He says you're most amusing out of court, too. Oh. Don't you quote poetry? Only in moments of great sadness, madam. Or extreme elation. Oh, Guthrie's so looking forward to leading you in his next big case. Leading me? Did you say leading me? Well, he has to have a junior now, doesn't he? Naturally, he wants the best junior available. Now he's a leader. Now he's left the junior bar. Ah, just for a pair of knee breeches he left us. Just for an elastic suspender belt I supplied to the nursing profession. Rumpel. Ah, my learned leader. <laughs> yes, of course. Well, would you excuse me? <laughs> Marigold. <laughs> Marigold, come join us. Uh, Albert, I tell you what. Hello, Uncle Tom. No, I, I just want to say that yeah. um, I, um, I don't see why recent events should uh, make any difference uh, to the situation in Chambers. Well, you're the senior man in practice, Rob. Ah, you wrong me, Brutus. You said an older soldier, not a better. <laughs> a quotation, Rumpel. <laughs> Very apt. Is it? No. <laughs> what I mean is, that I don't see why um, well, all this should make any difference. You'll have my full support as head of chamber. Oh, that. Mr. Winston! My dear fellow! Mr. Winston! Henry, a chair for Mr. Winston. Now, come on. Come on, here. 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 Oh, oh, you look wonderful. Good to see you. Albert, Albert wrote to me about this little celebration. I was determined to be with you. And the doctor's given permission for no more than one glass of champagne. One glass oh, of champagne. champagne. Oh, champagne coming up, sir. There we are. Great change in chambers. Now we have a silk. Guthrie Featherstone, QC, MP. For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so say all of us, and so say all of us. Thank you. You, Featherstone, have brought a great distinction to Chambers. Nice, Guthrie. You know, when I was a young man, you remember when we were young men, Uncle Tom? Oh, vaguely, yes. We used to hang around in Chambers for weeks on end, I well recall. We used to uh, occupy ourselves with an old golf ball and a mashing nimbic, trying to get chip shots into the waste pit. <laughs> 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 Albert was a boy then. I'm a child, Mr. Winston. And we, we used to pray for work. Any sort of work, didn't we, Uncle Tom? Yes, we were tempted to crime. The only way we could get into court. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as you grow older at the bar, you discover it's not having any work that matters. It's the quality that counts. Here, yeah, yeah. here. I'm always saying we should do more civil. No. Gutley Featherson QC MP will, of course, command briefs in all divisions. Yeah, yeah. Planning, contract, even chancery. Oh, come now, Winston. <laughs> I'm so afraid after I've gone, these chambers might become known as merely a criminal set. Disgraceful. And, of course, there's no doubt about it. Too much criminal work does rather lower the standing of the chambers. <laughs> Couldn't you, uh, couldn't you install pithead baths? Uh, oh, Horace. We well, could all have a good scrub down after we got back from the belly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, uh, Horace Rumpole, and I mean no disrespect whatever to my son-in-law. Daddy! It, oh, oh, oh. Uh, does practice almost exclusively in the criminal courts. One doesn't get the really fascinating points of law, not in criminal law. No, I've often thought that we should try to attract some really lucrative tax cases. Ah, the tax cases. Tax cases make the world go round. I mean, compared to the wonderful world of tax, crime's totally trivial. I mean, what does it matter? If a boy loses a year, two years of his life, hmm? Totally unimportant. Anyway, he'll grow up to be banged up for a good five, eh? Shut up with his own chamber pot in some convenient hole we all prefer not to think about. Now uh, then, Horace, your practice no doubt requires a good deal of skill. Skill? It's only about skill. Any fool can do it. It's only a matter of life and death. Crime's a sort of game. I mean, how can you compare it to the real world of offshore securities and deductible expenses? All you young men in chambers can learn an enormous amount from Horace Rumpel when it comes to crime. Good God, you make me sound just like Fred Timpson. Really? Ah, Champers, Albert. Whoever is Fred Timpson? Well, the Timpsons are Rumpel's favourite family. An industrious clan of South London criminals, aren't they, Rumpel? South London criminals. I mean, do we really want people like the Timpsons forever hanging around our waiting room? I merely asked the question. Oh, do you really? Merely ask it. 
Excuse me. The tips is there like, no doubt, grist to rub cold's mill. But it's the balance that counts. Yeah, sir. Now, uh, we'll be looking for a new head of chambers. I'd like you all to think it over carefully and put your views to be in writing. We should all try and remember it's the good of the chambers that matters. Are we, um, are we still looking? Not the feelings, however deep they may be, of any particular person. The good of chambers. The good, the good of, of chambers. chambers. Guthrie Featherston, head of chambers? By universal acclaim. I'm sorry. Oh, he can have the headaches. Trying to work out Albert's extraordinary bookkeeping system. Only you could have become a QC. QC? CT, that's good enough for me. CT? Whatever CT? Counsel for the Timpsons. Oh, Napoleon Impossible. You're not in court today. No, not today. Hey, it must be time to see Nick off. What are you reading? The Mysterious Adventures of the Speckle Band? Oh. Industrial soci sociology, Nick. Well, old Bagnall was talking about what I should read if I get into Oxford. It's very interesting. You astonish me, Holmes. I'll ring for the taxi. Of course you're going to read law, Nick. I thought perhaps PPE, and then go on to sociology. Oh, we're going to keep it in the family. PPE sounds very good, Nick. Very good indeed. For God's sake, let's stop keeping it in a family. And that's what's wrong, Nick. It's the devil of it. They're all being born around us all the time. Little Mr. Justice Everglades, little Timpsons, little Guthrie Featherstones. All being set off to follow in their father's footsteps. Well, let's have no more of that. No more following in father's footsteps. Hmm? See you at half turn, then. Right. Victoria Station, please. No more. Welcome to this episode. It's called Rumpel and the Younger Generation. It's the first of the series of Thames Television did. It introduces uh, Rumpel, the lovable, grumpy, uh, sometimes obstreperous old Bailey hack. It also introduces his wife, Hilda, who I really invented in order to give him as much of a tough time at home as he was getting at court, and his son, Nick, who comes to watch his father in court. And it introduces... Uh, the well-known family of South London villains called the Timpsons, who do ordinary decent crime and uh, actually keep Rumpole in bread and butter and an occasional uh, glass of wine at Pomeroy's wine bar. So uh, this is Nick, and he comes to see his father perform in court, and 
His father, Rumpole, hopes he has a noble idea of lawyers, and Nick perhaps doesn't have such a noble idea as Rumpole has and as I have. So, uh, welcome to the first episode. The butcher shop's there, opposite the church. There's only two old geezers with all that money. Come on in, who's going to do the tires? We can hide anywhere in here. about us in our embrace. Shades of the prison house begin to close around the growing boy. Oh, no. I'm not talking about your son, I hope. Ah. You're never referring to Nick. Oh, shades of the prison house begin to close, no, not round our boy. <coughs> not round young Nick. Shades of the public schoolhouse are closed round him. The thousand quid a year remand home. He's breaking up this morning. Ah, shades of the prison house begin to open up for the halls. Nick has to be met at Victoria at 11.15 and given lunch. When he went back to school, you promised him a show. Yes. You haven't forgotten. Of course I haven't forgotten. The only show I can offer him, I'm afraid, is a robbery with violence. Number two court at the Old Bailey. Oh, I wish it was a murder. Nick so enjoyed my murders. I must fly. They had to get so crotchety if anybody's late, and he does love his visits. Our father who art in Horsham. Give me your old sweetheart my regards. Oh, sweetheart is hardly the way you used to refer to your head of chambers. Yes, well, I find it difficult to remember to call my head of chambers daddy. Well, Nick, I'll be back in good time to give him his supper. Your wish is my command. And try not to make the kitchen look as if it had been hit by a bomb. I hear, O oh master of the blue horizon. <laughs> she who must be obeyed. Hello, son. Got special permission to come and see you, you being a lad of tender years and all. Well, you've got to know the ropes around here. I'm all right, is she? Mum, yeah, of course she's all right. Come over here. She's got your best jacket out to clean us. Take that off. Now, remember, 
stand up straight and keep your hands out of your pockets. The red judge at the old bailey is called my lord. Don't go call him sir or your honour. He'll show your ignorance. Sir, Peanuts Moy, he's giving evidence for the prosecution. Well, don't you worry about young Peanuts. Your brief will take care of him. We got you the best brief in the business. And Mr. Rampart. Oh, just remember, son, stand up straight and do what Mr. Rampart tells you. And good luck. You're all out there. The old family's behind you. Don't forget to put that tie on, will you? Yes, right, you are, then. Oh, we've got the papers in your indecent assault, Mr. Erskine Brown, down in London. Oh, really? I, was, I told you I wanted something on the civil side. I'm sick to death of crime. A person who's sick of crime is sick of life, Erskine Brown. And, Mr. Frobisher, you'll be doing your nuisance at Bloomsbury County Court. Ah, civil work, George. You lucky beggar. That's what I need. It's marked not before two o'clock. Yes, I can see that, old dear. One has to hang about, so to do a nuisance <laughs> nowadays. I shall go down to the library, Albert. Morning, Rumpel. Hello, George. Coming down to the library with me, Albert? The library? I'd rather spend the day in the morgue, old man. <laughs> Anything for me, Albert? Ah, no, Mr. McClay, another day off for you, I'm afraid. Ah, you're dangerous and careless at Clark was on the mantelpiece, Mr. Hoskins. No checks, I suppose, Albert. Not today, Mr. Hoskins, now. Henry? Yes, Mr. Tree? You want me to go down Clark Mark Court with Mr. Hoskins? We don't want you near any court, Henry. Not to have learnt to clean our fingernails and shine our shoes every morning, but you could make me a cup of instant, because I'm parched. No, no checks for me either, Percy. You know the old saying, crime doesn't pay. Well, not for a very long time. Listen, Tony, if you're to do so, why don't you join me down at the Bailey later on? You can uh, take a note or something. You sure you wouldn't mind? I'd be grateful. Where are we, Albert? Oh, the robbery's not before 11.30, sir. Court number two, before Everglade. Uh. Mr. Gusby Featherstone's against you. Oh, give me Featherstone. Apparently. Oh, I had an all night sure. sitting down at the house last night. Oh. I don't suppose your robbery will be much of a worry. Oh, no, except perhaps the young Jim Simpson. Oh, well, but uh, Mrs. Rumpole's gone down to see her father in, in um, Horsham. Oh, my aunt had a horse up in Tisham. <laughs> How is Mr. Any better, is he? Oh, no, it's just about the same, Uncle Tom. Thanks. And how's young Nick? Oh, splendid. Ah, Nick! Albert is breaking up today. He'll need a meeting at Victoria, the 11.15. And then if you bring him along, he can watch some of the robbery in number two. Hmm? Your son's going to be in the audience, is he? Yeah. That'd better be brilliant. Oh, I wouldn't bother, old man. She's old daddy's come to see you, after all. <laughs> touché, Rampo. Distinct more touché. Yeah. Thank well, you. I better get down to the Bailey. I'll walk with you. Oh, well, won't you need a stretcher or something after an all night sitting with the gas mains enabling bill or whatever? <laughs> Tony, see you later on. Oh, right. You've been at this game a long while, Rumpel. Oh, yes, quite a while. You never thought of taking oh. self? Well, Rumpel QC. Not on your nilly. Rumpel queer customer, that's what they'd be bound to call me. Well, could you now, with your seniority? Good morning, sir. Oh, I dare say. If I, uh, played golf with the right judges, put up for Parliament, they might make me an artificial suit. Or, uh, at any rate, a nylon. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. You did put up for Parliament. Yes. You've never thought of it? No, never. I have the honour to be an old Bailey hack. That's quite enough for me. Lord in Newgate Street, the city fathers, a stately law court did decree. And there it is. The dome and the blindfold lady. Yes, well, it's much better. She doesn't see all that's going on. Complete with murals, marble statues and underground accommodation for some of the choicest villains in London. Terrible things go on here. Horrifying things. Why is it I never go through these portals without a thrill of pleasure, a slight tremble of excitement? Now why does it always seem a much jollier place than my flat in Gloucester Road, under the strict rule of she who must be obeyed? Morning, Harry. Morning, gentlemen. Morning, Harry. I'll have to give up. 
I'll have to give up, you know. Cropped up, I'm afraid. Oh, nonsense, Daddy. You'll go on for years. No, Hilda, no. I'll have to start looking for another head of chambers. Rumpel's the senior man. That is, of course, apart from Uncle Tom, and he doesn't really practice nowadays. Your husband's a senior man. How time flies. I recall when he was the junior man, my pupil. You said... <coughs> He was the best youngster on bloodstains you'd ever known. Rumpo, oh yes. Her husband was pretty good on bloodstains. Shaky, though, on the law of landlord and tenant. What sort of practice is Rumpo now? Oh, he has a tremendously busy practice. Rumpo hardly ever stops. He's in court today. Which court? I believe today it's um, the Old Bailey. It's always the Old Bailey, isn't it? Most of the time. Yes, not a frightfully good address, the old Bailey, not exactly the SW1 of the legal profession. Oh, Rumpel only went down to the Bailey today because he knows the family. Mm. It seems they've got a young boy in trouble. Son gone wrong. Mm. Yeah, very sad, that. Especially if he comes of a really good family. Ah, the Timpsons, en famille, in all their glory. It's like an old school reunion. I've never seen so many ex-clients at one go. Mr. Rumpel. Oh, Mr. Bernard. You're instructing me. Always in a Timpson case, Mr. Rumpel. Oh, nothing but the best for the Timpsons. Best solicitor, best barrister going. Yeah. Shall I do the honours? Yes, dear. There's Vi, my wife. I've got Vi off on a handling charge after the Croydon bank raid. Well, there was really no evidence. Uncle Cyril? What was his last outing exactly? Carrying housebreaking instruments by night. Uncle Dennis? Uh, oh, you remember Dan, surely, Mr. Oh, Uncle yes. Conspiracy to forge logbooks. And uh, Dan's Doris? He would have been receiving a vast quantity of stolen scampi. Yes, acquitted by a majority. Uh, yours truly, Frederick Timpson, the boy's father. Oh, we had a slip up with Fred's last spot of bother. I was away with flu. Well, uh, shall we all sit down? George Frobisher took it over. He got three years. Oh, he must have only just got out. So, uh, now you know the whole family, Mr. Rampo. A family to breed from, the Timpsons. Without them, the old bear leaves you out of business. From time to time, uh, I'm quite sure you're going to do your very best for our young Jimbo. He's a good boy. He was ever so good to me while Dad was away. Head of the family at 14, with Dad off on one of his regular visits to Her Majesty. It's uh, young Jim's first appearance, like, at the Bailey. Yeah. His bar mitzvah, his first communion. All those other boys got clean away with it. Yes, well, that's a bit of luck. They can't be asked if Jimbo was one of the party. The identification by the butcher is pretty hopeless. Yes, well, would you have a photographic impression of a young hopeful that struck you on the skull with a cricket stump? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, all they've really got is uh, this alleged confession that Jim made to Peanuts Malloy. Peanuts Malloy, little grass. Yeah, old Chalky White fed him up with that one, didn't he? Yeah. Chalky? Uh, Chief Detective Inspector White, L Division. Well, why would Inspector White want to fit up your Jimbo exactly? Well, because he's a Timson, Mr. Rumpel. Yeah, because he's the apple of our eye like. Being as how he's the baby of the family. <laughs> but Chalky would fit up his own mother if he'd get him a smile off his superintendent, you know. Morning, Fred. Morning, Chief Inspector. Morning, Mrs. Timson. Morning, Chief Inspector. Um, Mr. Timpson, I think we'll shift our ground. Remove, good friends. 